Hello, in this video we will be looking at perhaps the most iconic hi-fi ever created, the Bang & Olufsen BOSAR 9000. We will then talk about the development and the challenges of getting mine. This will be followed by an in-depth review, so let's get started. It was launched in 1996 when CD was king, however the CD changer wasn't a new thing. There were already many on the market. The magazine slot loading type, like in the Bose Lifestyle and many car CD changers, and the much larger carousel types. Some CD changers from Sony could hold as many as 200 CDs. But for Bang & Olufsen, this simply wouldn't do. They had a long history of producing hi-fi that looked like nothing else. While this was a company-wide approach, and a point of difference, their design lead, David Lewis, was responsible for much of the unique design. He once said, form is nothing more than an extension of content. Who says that loudspeakers should hide away in corners? If the closer they get to you, the better they sound. Lewis was steeped in the idea that any product should have a long life both in desirability and endurance. His inspiration would often come from regular visits to art galleries, museums and Danish antique dealers specialising in mid-century furniture and architectural design. The philosophy behind the 9000 was to make a CD changer that had the same characteristics as record changers. The ability to play music for a long time and to show the listener what they were listening to. In designing the Biosound 9000 from scratch, a number of design models were created in order to illustrate various ideas. In returning to square one, the designers considered the dominating feature as for a CD changer is the ability to play continuously for a long period of time. In coming up with a solution for this problem, the discs were placed with their covers upwards and in a line next to each other, protected under a lid of transparent glass. This was the main idea behind the very first design model of the Biosound 9000. David Lewis presented the first design model of the Biosound 9000 in two editions, the one which we know today with its six CDs, as well as another model comprising of ten compact discs laid out in a line next to each other. The design group he presented to liked the ten CD edition. It looked stunning, but in use it was limited to just one placement. The ten CD version was subsequently shelved with a six CD version going into production in 1996. David Lewis's Biosound 9000 makes a virtue of showing its function. It clearly displays that its function is the playing of music. It can be placed horizontally on a wall or vertically on a special column where it becomes almost a sculpture for the home. And it really is a sculpture. It was awarded the Product Design of the Year Award in 1997 by the World Design Centre. When it was launched, it cost 4,000 US for the 9,000. The speakers were an extra 3,000, and the stand was an extra 500. That's 7,500 US dollars, which with inflation would be around about 13,000 US or 18,000 New Zealand today, which is not exactly cheap. But there were many ways which you could spend more if you wanted to. Over its production, it was available in many special editions. Some carry a small premium like the white edition and a pink edition. The black edition is quite a bit more though, around $12,000 in today's market. If art is more your thing, then here is one that has been customised by artist Jackson Pollock. Only $25,000 US dollars. If gold is your thing, then that's no problem, only $60,000 US dollars. And if that's still too cheap, then the Bang & Olufsen Biosound 9000 customised by Stuart Hughes is officially the most expensive hi-fi ever, at $1.66 million US. According to Stuart Hughes, it was reformed with 32 kilograms of 24 karat gold. So it's made of solid gold, not plated and 72 diamonds were tacked onto the front. I doubt it sounds any better, but hey, taste is an individual thing. Someone out there won't think that it's vulgar. 
journey to get my Bingham Olsen 9000 has been quite a long one and where I live in New Zealand they are quite rare and don't often come up for sale. It all started in late 2019 when a non-functioning Bang & Olufsen BO Sound 9000 came up on the auction site Trade Me. I won it for just under 400 New Zealand dollars. It then just sat around until the beginning of this year where a pair of BO Lab 8000 speakers came up for auction. I subsequently won these for just under 1000 New Zealand dollars. I then thought that it would be a good idea to get my 9000 fixed and working. I did take the covers off and inspect to see if there was anything glaringly obvious like a fuse, but when I did, I discovered that this thing was packed thick with circuit boards. Previous experience with Bang & Olufsen equipment told me that this might be best left to an expert. It was going to be a little harder to fix than a Bose lifestyle. Luckily I live in Auckland, so I was able to find the one man in the North Island who might be able to repair it, Scott at ET Electronics. I honestly thought that it would be a few weeks and it would be back working, only needing to spend maybe a thousand dollars in repairs. Boy was I wrong. And I learnt just how complicated and finicky Bang & Olufsen products can be. Like I said, this was non-functional, which made identifying the problem quite difficult. The second problem that was that this was a Mark 1 9000, for which there are very few parts worldwide. After a few months of trying to source a power supply circuit board, one was found, but that was also faulty. When one that worked was finally found, it was discovered that there were other problems that stopped it working properly and the CD laser was also stuffed. Which meant that I learned after five months it was beyond economical repair. Ah uh, yes, the speakers. Those were good, weren't they? No. Firstly, cosmetics. The speaker fabric had crudely been removed by the previous owner and therefore needed to be recovered, which I did after I got some speaker fabric. The heavy black bases were also a bit rusty and tired, so I stripped these back and repainted them. All good to go then? No, unfortunately not. When I played them, they sounded hollow and horrible. This was quite disappointing. Something wasn't right. The seller assured me that they did work, and I couldn't see anything wrong with the drivers, visually. So how can these speakers sound so bad? I then learnt that Bang & Olufsen in their infinite wisdom decided that the acoustic foam that they use inside the speakers should slowly react with moisture over time and then disintegrate into a black gooey mess. Which means not only does something corrosive seep onto the circuit boards and potentially cause damage, it also means there is no sound dampening. Mine were no exception. They would need to be taken apart cleaned up and re-foamed. Now I'm not one to shy away from a project. I've taken more hi-fi and speakers apart than I can remember, but given the complexity, I decided that this would be best left to a professional, Scott. But with no BO Sound 9000, I wasn't rushing. Then there was a light at the end of a tunnel, a bright and expensive light in the form of Bang and Olufsen Auckland. Through Scott, I learned that they had a waiting list for BO Sound 9000 models and I was promptly added to that waiting list. After a few months, I learned that a refurbished Mark III was going to become available. It was soon offered to me for acquisition. I actually had to be chosen to buy it. And $4,500 later, it was mine. So much for getting a cheap one. That's actually 11 times more than I spent on the first one I purchased. Then the speakers went in and $780 later they were back, fixed and working. I finally had a working hi-fi. Well, almost. As I had no cables, Bang & Olufsen used proprietary 8-pin DIN connectors on their cables and there were none in New Zealand, so I had to make my own. I did this by getting shielded network cable and attaching 8-pin DIN plugs, which proved to be quite fiddly and difficult. My 9000 Mark I ended up staying with Scott to be used for parts. The cost for work he did on it was comparable to the value of a non-functional unit. So as I had no need for it, it stayed with him and I didn't pay anything. I did get to keep the floor stand, which separately go for around about 678 US dollars. 
For one thing, I don't yet have is a remote control for the 9000, which is to B04. I was told by Bang & in Auckland that it would be around 250 NZ or 170 US to get one. I could also get the BO Remote 1. That costs a hefty 375 US dollars. The front of a Bang & Olufsen BO Sound 9000 is dominated by this large piece of smoked glass. It's motorised of course being Bang & Olufsen and to open it you click here and it will were open. Behind the smoke glass is this large piece of brushed aluminium that uh, covers the entire length of the unit. It wouldn't have been cheap to produce and it looks absolutely spectacular. This also gives you access to the CDs and this is how you take them out and then put them back in. Looking towards the rear of the unit you can see that the back of it is covered in this big piece of black plastic. Also uh, along the side are these quick access buttons which allow you to select uh, whichever disc you would like and once you click them the disc will were to that disc and start playing. Now this is sitting on the optional floor stand and the floor stand's construction is also made out of brushed aluminium which very closely matches the brushed aluminium of the Bang Olufsen BO Sound 9000. Over on this side is this gunmetal grey piece of ribbed aluminium which is continued below to keep the look consistent. Behind this is the controls for the Bang Olufsen BO Sound 9000. The control panel has one really cool feature. It's all on this removable uh, panel here which can be turned around and placed in the opposite direction depending on how you have a Bang Olufsen BO Sound 9000 mounted. And when you place it back in the opposite way, the text here turns around also. The heart of the Bang Olufsen BO Sound 9000 is its CD mechanism, lovingly known as the clamper. It not only houses the CD laser, it also has the display built in here which can move up and down to any of the six CDs that you may have in the machine. When you turn it on, a light also turns on and depending on which orientation you have the Bang Olufsen BO Sound 9000 in, this panel here can be rotated so that it can perfectly align. Perhaps the standout feature of the Bang Olufsen BO Sound 9000 is the speed in which it can change CDs. If it was a car, it would be accelerating from 0 to 100 km an hour in 5.5 seconds, making this the fastest CD changer ever made. Let me demonstrate. So let's say we want to play the first CD. And it speeds up and starts playing the first CD. And then let's say we want to play this CD here. We'll speed down and start playing that CD. This is a truly remarkable piece of engineering and it took Bang & Olufsen a long time to get this perfected. You might be thinking that having a fast moving mechanism could be dangerous for your fingers if you were to accidentally stick them in the machine like this. Luckily Bang & Olufsen has thought of that by placing these two little pieces of plastic here and here which house a laser which is always seeing if there's something in its way. So let's say I put my hand in here and I select the bottom CD, doesn't actually want to move. It's actually detected that my fingers are in there and it's like, hang on a minute, we can't go right now. Now let's say I remove my hand. It should now slowly move down and then it will start playing. Now you may have noticed that all of these CDs are placed in the machine with their text horizontal and Bang Olufsen has designed this mechanism here to always remember the position of the CD when you put it in so that it can return it to that position when you finish playing a CD. So look at this blue CD here. Let's say we want to start playing it. The clamper moves up, starts playing it, and let's say now we want to play a different CD. The text is perfectly aligned and in exactly the same position as you 
placed it in. The controls of the Bang Olufsen BO Sound 9000 are relatively straightforward. You've got things like loudness, balance, bass, treble, mute, volume, controls of V. You've got a timer function so you can set a time and have it turn on and turn off at certain times. You've got uh, a bunch of CD controls here, like I've just talked about. You've got naming, then you can, I assume, edit and clear the naming of those CDs. You've also got random. You've got a radio. It will show you the station that you're listening to with the uh, RMS information. There's also an auxiliary port. So to name a CD, it's quite a long-winded process. So as you can see, I've named this one here, Natalie Merchant, although I think you only have so many characters. I'd actually have to check in the instruction manual if that wasn't the case. But let's say we wanted to name this CD here which is the cause in blue. So go up to there, you click on naming, and then you have to painstakingly go through all the characters. It's <laughs> Then it says naming OK, and you click OK, and it says cause in blue. Um, I guess it's a useful feature, but um, in 2021 it feels fairly archaic. But the good thing is, is that when you then uh, sleep the next CD, it remembers the uh, CD name that you put in. And apparently, like I said, this can swap to 200 CD names. Perhaps my least favourite part of the design is actually connecting things to the Bang Olufsen Bio Sound 9000. It's all done here and this is extremely tight and especially on the vertical stand you have to uh, you have to feed all the wires through this long cylinder which is quite difficult which means you have to have it laid out on the floor in quite an awkward position to get the cables through it and then you have to sort of really fiddle with them and you can't actually see what you're plugging into it's it's pretty difficult but i guess once you've done it you only have to do it once this also has a digital uh, output for uh, audio if you want to connect up to another stereo. The BioLab 8000 speakers came out in 1992 and they were also designed by David Lewis. They also won a design award. Something that you may not know is that these are separate products from the 9000. And over the 15 years of the 9000 production, the 9000 could be paired with many of Bang & Olufsen's loudspeakers. That said, Bang & Olufsen always intended the 9000 to be paired with the Biolab 8000s, as can be seen in the owner's manual, various brochures, and advertisements. Paired together, they look stunning. Like the 9000, the Biolab 8000s could be ordered in different colours. Officially, you could choose from red, blue and black, with the speaker fabric also available in white and grey. These can also easily be customised with different colours. For some reason, you can also order these wooden grills, which make them look more like their successor, the Biolab 18s. I'm not sure why though. The base of a Biolab 8000 speakers is a large, heavy, square slab of steel, which is the only place the Bang & Olufsen logo appears. It needs to be heavy, as it keeps the speaker from tipping over. And they work pretty well. It's not as top-heavy as you might expect. Secured by just a single, thick bolt, out of a base comes an almost gravity-defying, polished stainless steel cone. The conical shape then meets a long, polished stainless steel cylinder that continues to the top of the speaker, making for a very striking design. Around the back of the cone are the inputs for the speaker. You can either use a line-level RCA or the proprietary 8-pin connector called PowerLink. This is also where the power for the speaker goes. Why do you need to plug these speakers in? Well, they are active speakers, which means that all the amplification circuitry is housed inside the speaker. Removing the cover of the speaker, you can see that there are two 10cm woofers, and above this is a smaller tweeter, and at the top of the speaker is a bass port which channels the sound from the rear of the two woofers. Below all of this is a large heatsink 
behind which is all the amplification circuitry. Okay, so that was a bit of a demonstration of how the Bang Allison BO Sound 9000 sounds with BO Lab 8000 speakers. Now, to me, the listener, there were definitely some good points. Clarity is one of the highest points. You can hear more detail in music than you can hear in a lot of other stereo and hi fi systems I've listened to. There's uh, detail in the sound that you just do not hear in, say, the Bose Lifestyle that I reviewed in my last video. Negatives, bass, they don't have the greatest bass response. They do an okay job, but not amazing. Um, if you read anything online, there'll be lots of people who talk about these speakers saying that Bang Olufsen managed to redefine a rule book by making these small speakers or in a small space uh, produce a large amount of bass. But for me, the listener, I would say maybe not true. Maybe, maybe a little bit of smoke and mirrors there because it doesn't it doesn't have room filling bass so of course the uh, solution for that is to get a subwoofer now i could get a bang and olison bo lab 2 subwoofer but these are quite expensive and as the stereo has cost me probably almost seven thousand dollars uh, I don't really want to spend an extra two and a half thousand dollars on a subpar subwoofer. Now I say subpar because from what I hear, the Bo Lab 2 is designed primarily for movies rather than music, and I'd really like a music-first approach, so a music-optimized uh, subwoofer. Now finding a subwoofer that has line-level input and output for both stereo channels is proving to be a little bit more difficult but not impossible, but I need to find the right subwoofer because it needs to have line level input and a crossover uh, so that these are only really being sent the mid and mid range and treble and all the bass is gonna be handled by the subwoofer. That's my ideal. That'll also mean I'll have to make custom cables because the cables that come with Bang Olufsen, the uh, BO Link cables I showed you before, V8 pin, will not fit into any normal subwoofer so I'll have to make custom cables to accommodate this. But I think it'll be worth it because I think with a subwoofer these speakers will sound really good and it will be approaching a decent sounding hi-fi system. To be honest, for the money that this costs, even second hand, I don't think the sound is absolutely blown out of the water amazing. I think for the money you'd be better off spending just that little bit more and getting maybe a pair of uh, Meridian M6 uh, active speakers 
because they will have a better sound quality. So what has the stereo cost me so far? Adding it all up, it's cost me around $6,700 or $4,650, US which is more than I spent on my old car. I also want to mention that the 9000 Mark III that I brought was refurbished and had a new laser fitted, and while expensive, it was comparable to what a refurbished Mark III imported into New Zealand would cost when shipping and duty was added. If you are looking at getting a 9000, then there are a few things to note. There were three versions of the 9000, the Mark I, II and III. The Mark III's go for the most, as they are the newest. Common problems are that the CD lasers die and need to be replaced. Prices range from a specialist from around US$1,000 for a Mark I to $2,700 for a Mark III. The white editions are more. There were also three versions of the 8000 speakers, the Mark I and II, followed by the 8002, which were visually identical. If you're buying from a specialist, then a pair of refurbished 8000 Mark I speakers will set you back just over US$1,000, ranging to US$3,100 for the 8002 speakers. Remember that the foam in these speakers goes bad, so this can cause issues. So that was my journey to get my Bang & Olufsen VO Sound 9000. I hope you enjoyed watching, and if you did, I'd appreciate a thumbs up, or feel free to subscribe. I will make a follow-up video when I find a suitable subwoofer, but it's bye for now. Thanks for watching.